This is Duke University. Greetings from Oxford to everyone. Uh, so happy to see everyone here today. Um, wanted to introduce to you uh, the Society of European Scholars, which is uh, right now uh, in its fourth year. So when we receive a Mellon grant to support interdisciplinary activities and connections between the Center for European Studies and other centers and departments on campus, uh, we thought of uh, the group on campus that is most creative interdisciplinarily, the graduate students, who yet need both support and a site to coordinate their intellectual exchange. And uh, the Council for European Studies provided it with the Mellon Grant on Jews and Muslims, History, Diaspora, and the Meaning of the European. So for four years, we have had students, 10 at the beginning, 20 nowadays, who work on common themes and projects relating to the themes of the Center for European Studies, um, who share work, give feedback, correspond on a blog, and they will be presenting the work to you today. When the Mellon Grant ran out, the Duke Center for, Europe for uh, Jewish Studies and the Religion and Public Life Initiative at the Kinnan Institute came with financial support for the Society of European Scholars, and we are very appreciative of their support. Themes have been added throughout the years reasonable accommodations, minorities in the globalized nation state, and with the return of religion, religions, and public life. I'm glad you'll have the opportunity today to meet some of the wonderful members of the Society of European Scholars and hear about their work. And, as I'm in Oxford, we shall have the program coordinator of the Council for European Studies, the eminent Virgil White, lead and moderate our discussion. So what I look at is comics, um, written in French, produced in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Um, they were serial comics, which means they came in episodes, and they were also published serially, um, a page or two at a time, in weekly journals and magazines um, that circulated in France and Belgium and throughout the, the empire. They were read weekly in this post-war, complicated, longer post-war decolonial period. They were read weekly by upwards of a million boys and girls, um, mostly boys aged 7 to 15 or 16. And when albums came out, boys became collectors, and some of the series became classics. So I'm sure people will recognize. Ten Ten, here are some of the, the, um, the characters that have become more well-known. And here are some of the um, some of the adventures in the albums. So what interests me really is the adventure. So this format of the grand adventure and all of the genres that fit under the adventure. Adventures during this time period were actually very worldly. And by worldly, I mean that they mapped the world. They mapped its wars, past and present, um, its peoples and its societies. And they commented, because they were popular literature, they were able to comment. They needed to comment on what was going on. So they commented on Reconstruction and the Cold War. They commented on modernization and, of course, decolonization. Um, in terms of messaging, if this is even really uh, something we can still talk about today, um, they were colonialist and imperialist, of course. Um, but there were also communist uh, magazines um, with communist-leaning um, uh, adventures. A lot were apologist in certain ways, uh, but many were unclear. So you had image and you had text. And they both combined to do different things or to do separate things at the same time. And you could read them in very different ways. Um, what interests me specifically is the Westerns. So the one vein of Westerns, we know what Westerns are, but one vein is cowboy and Indian stories. Um, so Westerns generally tell tales of 19th century imperial expansion in the United States towards the West, uh, towards the Pacific. Um, they tell stories of skirmishes, wars, and setbacks, but also um, displacements, massacres, internment, containment, reservations. Um, and they were really uh, important. They were really uh, interested in the landscape. So they mythologize a certain Western landscape. This is um, John Ford's film Stagecoach from 1939. 
And this is uh, Monument Valley. This is Arizona-Utah border. And this has become an iconic, iconic image of sort of this western landscape. And it's rough and wild, untamable, um, untamed and uninhabitable. Um, and within these landscapes, white heroes, of course, vanquish non-whites. I mean, this is sort of what the, what the genre was intended to do. But they were also, because they were popular, Westerns are a popular format, a genre tale, um, they responded to their moments and they were messy portraits. They could be read in many different ways. So my research argues that, that Franco-Belgian comics, or comics written by, by French um, authors and by Belgian authors, or teams of Franco-Belgian um, authors, they hit it really big. Their popularity arc was specifically um, during decolonization, the era of the European decolonizations from 40 to, six to 70, but really, really uh, during the um, Algerian War of Independence from France, so 1945 to 1962. Narratives circulating at this time in France, um, travel narratives, a lot of the myths, uh, the colonial mythologies, also a lot of the travel memoirs, they as well painted this Algerian landscape. These are photos of Algeria during the war. This Algeria landscape as impenetrable, inhospitable. The mountains of Kabylia in the north, Algeria is four-fifths the Sahara Desert. So in the north, these mountains were fortresses of resistance. They had been since the French um, conquest in 1830. So they had tanks in the Sahara in this, in this really difficult landscape. And also, the way the war unfolded had a lot to do with this, this, this type of landscape. So the methods of warfare were sort of justified because of the type of landscape you're in. We had ambushes, so we needed torture. Um, there was internment because you had to contain Algerian populations. There were massacres because you just couldn't see your enemy, so you just had to deal with it where you could. Um, so as France was losing Algeria, fighting to keep Algeria, but losing Algeria, which was not actually a colony, it was considered three departments of France itself, um, the Westerns became really popular with children. And Westerns told the same kinds of stories with the same themes and the same types of protagonists and antagonists, only they displaced all that action into the 19th century of America. So the impact of the CES on my research has been really great. Um, I've been uh, with the CES for four years. And I have presented bits and pieces of this research to the different groups, and I've gotten their, gotten their feedback on them. This dissertation is um, way too ambitious for its own good. It's um, interdisciplinary. It spans three continents, um, roughly 200 years. It's a comparative history of the American and the French imperialisms um, across over a 100-year span. It's a cultural history of a very complicated moment of time, in time, the post-war period. Um, and it's also attempting to be a socio-historical study of comics, um, which is just not done. There are thousands of comics, and so to try and synthesize this is, is, is ill-advised. Um, so for me, the discussions within this group have been really great. The, the fellows are a great sounding board. They come from many different um, points of view, and they're able to help me um, uh, conceptualize and reconceptualize in ways that I need to. Um, there are two types of writing in particular that, that have helped. So we all blog on, um, on a private blog. We all blog our comments, and they stay up. So when I've gone back to revise chapters, I've actually revisited my comments that I've received, and they've really helped. We also encourage a different kind of writing. We do write-ups on public websites of the events and, and the conferences that are hosted by the CES. So that, that enables us to, um, to listen to to listen to talks outside of our own very narrow um, interests and where we feel comfortable to step outside of our, our comfort zone and to be able to comment um, as sort of better academic citizens as, and also as public intellectuals. So that's, I think, uh, a real strength of the CES. Thank you. All right, thank you, Eliza. Um, next, we have Nura Sadiq. She is a Ph. candidate in political science, specializing in behavior and identities. She is also completing her certificate in African and African American studies. Prior to Duke, Nura worked with this, within the civil rights field and attained her master in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Her dissertation research focuses on how identity influences political behavior for Muslim Americans.
Good afternoon. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's been really great to be a part of this community as a social scientist, sort of stepping out of my frame of considering my questions and thinking about it from other perspectives has been great. Um, I'm presenting my project within our um, group later this month, so I'm a little nervous because um, the students, in our, I think they provide much more thoughtful feedback than some of the faculty often do. So it's been an incredible experience. And it's also good to get yourself to really question the assumptions you make. As a social scientist, I think of things in a very specific way that I've been trained. And then when you discourse with students from other disciplines and modes of training, you really reanalyze the assumptions you've made when you've come towards your research. So um, I began this project, so just to give you a little bit of a teaser to my work, on Muslim Americans three years ago, not realizing that we would become um, more and more interesting as each election cycle went on. So um, campaign politics has really motivated some of this. So we saw a lot of this discourse within the election season with um, the way that different um, political candidates were discussing Muslims. Um, my big question really is, um, Muslim Americans make up a very diverse community of individuals, right? So you have a really rich history of African Americans who embraced Islam um, back from you know, the 1900s forward. You have immigrant Muslims, and they don't necessarily convene in the same congregations. They don't necessarily come together in specific spaces. But in terms of public discourse, they're all kind of put lumped together, right? Uh, when you think of a Muslim, you don't necessarily think of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Um, but so that's one example, sort of like thinking about like the different athletes and people who make up the community, right? So my my question is, given, um, and I'm gonna go. So there's a lot of amazing research done on um, what's happening to Muslims, right? Um, they're kind of being lumped together, seen in a specific way by uh, the public. My question is, what do Muslims themselves um, think um, when they see these images of themselves? Do Muslims from different backgrounds um, and different social cleavages identify as a group collectively or not? And this is a really interesting question because it really brings together questions of religion and race because there's this notion of racialization. Muslims have been racialized. And what does racialization mean? It essentially means other people kind of uh, defining who you are for yourself, right? That's basically like the, the most basic way I can uh, describe it. Um, and a lot of the work in political science has focused on Asian Americans, Latinos, and black Americans. And we've seen this process happen for Asian Americans. You may have come as a first generation Vietnamese, not realizing that your children are going to identify more as Asian American than as Vietnamese. So you've seen this process happen for other minority groups. So my question is, what does this process look like for Muslim Americans? And what I do is I look at survey data. So I want to just give you a teaser to my survey data, I um, analyze data from Pew, and my uh, sample is 28% um, Muslim, I'm 28% American, 22% uh, Middle East, North African, and so you sort of see the diverse range of individuals that are in my sample. It's about 1,000 individuals. Um, that's a pretty nationally representative sample of um, Muslims in the United States from different backgrounds. What I try to look at is they're asked, um, do you think of yourself first as an American, or first as a Muslim, or both? And I really look at that question as a way of looking at identity. So do you think of yourself, so I'm trying to figure out um, who thinks of themselves as Muslim first, and what are the factors that influence that relationship? And a lot of people, this is beyond, so sort of I, my hypothesis going into this was, that this isn't just a case of people being religious. If you're religious, you go to the mosque, you're gonna uh, you know, identify with whatever congregation, yes, I'm Muslim, I go to the mosque. But what happens to people who aren't religious? Um, do they identify as Muslim first, even if they're not um, religiously observant? And my findings show that yes, they do under specific conditions. And what are those conditions? How much time do I have left? Because a few minutes, okay. So these are my group identity results. And in my sample, I find that 48% uh, of my sample identifies primarily as Muslim, 31 and a half primarily as American, and 20 um, in both. So what predicts sort of like your likelihood to identify primarily as Muslim? The interesting story there is discrimination. So they're asked six um, questions. Did you ex experience discrimination walking outside? They're given a battery of questions. And what I find is that if you've 
went through an experience of discrimination just once, your likelihood to identify exclusively as Muslim is statistically significant, which like that's the buzzword for political scientists. If your p-value is at a specific way, you're like doing, you know, you're dancing. It's, but it's um, it's really interesting because it's not like an individual that's experienced it multiple times. It just takes one experience of discrimination for someone to go from seeing themselves as oh both American and Muslim to you know what I'm just Muslim, and so this attachment to this group identity. And you see this even when I control for religious observance. So the assumption here is that. Even if you're not religiously observant, if you experience discrimination that's attached to your identity, your likelihood to identify as Muslim increases. So then um, other factors, and this gets into religion and public life, which is our group. The other big factor is civic engagement. So um, for those who uh, participate within civic activities, the likelihood to identify as Muslim and, and, and American collectively as both increases. So the more you're engaged in public life, the more you kind of see yourself as both. You're not exclusively Muslim or exclusively American. You're sort of like this camp in the middle and you're reconciling both. So it's interesting to see what engagement in public life does to one's identity. And my work sort of extending on this, and I'm not gonna go through the rest of the models, but really in terms of my dissertation, there's two key pieces to this that I'm gonna do moving forward. One, 2017, if you've been watching the news at all, is a really interesting year for Muslims, so I'm gonna field more data. That's like the most, you know, give, we give the media a lot to talk about. Um, but, um, so the question is what's happening to Muslims now that they're seeing this news come in? And this data is from a couple years back. So rerunning some of these questions and adding more questions on political participation in public life is uh, a project I'm currently working on. And then the second question is on black Muslims specifically. So what hasn't been analyzed within my field in political science is that black Muslims, when they re-accepted Islam, because a lot of um, uh, slaves that were, came in were Muslim and then the religion died out, um, they accepted Islam as an act of political resistance. So the act of being Muslim and being black was very much political in terms of the conversion process in the early 1900s. So that's a really interesting story that hasn't been well documented within the discipline of political science well. It's been documented within African and African American studies and the humanities, but in terms of as, as a social scientist really re-examining, it's a really basic assumption we've made about um, why um, you know African Americans attachment to religion is only looked at from a Christian perspective. So that's the other sort of project that I'll be looking at moving forward. But being in this space and kind of collectively discussing all these issues with my colleagues has made this a really exciting time. So thank you. Thank you, Nara. So next we have Thomas R. Prendergast. And he is a PhD student in history at Duke specializing in the intellectual and cultural history of East Central Europe. His work explores the political, philosophical, and artistic spheres in which Europe's peripheries, East, Central, as well as Southern Europe, sought around the turn of the 20th century to challenge prevailing notions of modernization and developmental abnormality. Currently, he is researching the emergence and institutionalization of sociology in the Habsburg monarchy, he is a Nathan J. Perlman Fellow in Judaic Studies and a J.B. Duke Fellow, and holds a BA in History and Comparative Literature from the University of Chicago. Um, hi, so thank you all for coming out. Um, so I'm going to talk about my project. I'm also going to talk about uh, interdisciplinarity and how that plays out in, um, in our two groups. Uh, <laughs> never used one of these before. Um, yeah, so as Malachi mentioned, we have two research groups, Jews and Muslims, and Religions and Public Life. Um, I coordinate the Jews and Muslims group, um, and I'm going to talk both about my work and about the work of other people in this group to give you a sense of this, the, the, the different projects that we're working on and different uh, fields that are represented and approaches. So. My research, um, I'm interested essentially in how empires attempted to justify themselves in the late 19th century in a world of nationalizing states. 
So I'm, it's a, it's a transnational European history, but it's anchored in East Central Europe, and specifically the Habsburg monarchy um, around the turn of the 20th century. And I'm particularly interested in how social scientists attempted to explain um, the emergence of, of states and what that means for um, these multinational empires like the Habsburg monarchy, like Russia, like the Ottoman Empire. Um, and so I'm particularly interested in several figures that come out of um, the sort of periphery of the Habsburg monarchy and how they used uh, an, an idea of sociology to justify um, imperial formations. Um, and this, this, was, um, this challenged many of the uh, prevailing uh, discourses of the time, which were deeply rooted in a kind of um, historicism that, that saw nations as kind of the ultimate uh, form of modernity and the end point of, of history. Um, and uh, most of my figures that I'm, I'm interested in were Jewish. Um, they came from Galicia and uh, from the Bukovina, which are two provinces on the eastern edge of Habsburg monarchy. And today are split between Poland and the Ukraine. Um, and I'm interested, so I'm interested in Habsburg Jewish intellectual cultural contributions to this um, attempt to modernize the Habsburg um, state ideas, often how they refer to it. And then also in comparative, um, in the kind of comparative questions, looking at the Habsburg Empire in relationship to uh, mainly Russia, also Ottoman Empire to a certain extent. Um, and then this is a, just a map of the Habsburg Empire, which shows you just how sort of, um, how complex it was uh, ethno-linguistically and also uh, administratively. Um, and so this was the kind of context in which these people were um, thinking and working and trying to explain why this sort of state should exist when many people questioned, uh, questioned its legitimacy. Uh, so now I'm going to talk briefly about some of the work being um, done by other scholars. We have um, fellows in my group from German studies, from Romance languages, from religious studies, and from history. Um, so we have work on German Jewish Enlightenment. We have work on uh, Spanish identity in the 16th century. Um, we have work on uh, a, a Italian travel literature and in their um, discussions of the Ottoman Empire in the uh, early modern period. Uh, we also have work on, we have someone working on public piety in, in um, the Counter-Reformation in Bavaria. And then our history uh, contingent, we have people working on um, Sephardic Jews in, in France, uh, particularly Jews coming from the Ottoman Empire to, to France. Um, in, uh, in the interwar period. Um, we also have work on Germany, uh, on Russia, um, and then we have a sort of transnational comparison of textbooks in the interwar period, which looks at Italy and Germany um, in, 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 uh, after 1945. So, uh, so what does this scholarly collaboration uh, do for us? So having people from these different backgrounds and disciplines come together we, uh, we enjoy interdisciplinary approaches to the same time period or same place, people coming from history versus from religious studies, even if they're talking about the same country um, and same time period, roughly, it brings a whole different perspective. Um, and so in addition to people working on these sort of transnational um, or trans-regional projects, uh, having people come together uh, allows you to kind of expand your horizons, as some of us have already talked about, um, to, to allows you to, to make those sorts of comparisons or expand your research beyond a given national or regional context. And um, third, there's, um, there are a few things that, um, at least in the Jews and Muslims group, that we uh, share in common thematically. Um, there's a shared interest in social scientific discourses of modernity. Um, there's a shared interest in 
the transition from empires to nation states and how that relates to um, religion and ethnicity and the relationship between religion and ethnicity. Um, and also, there's a, there's a shared interest in literature as one site um, where these, these questions are, are played out. So, thank you. So I'll warn you now, I know you've been eating, but you may be hungry after this next presentation because it is, has delicious pictures. Um, Kelly Alexander is a third year doctoral student in cultural anthropology and also a professional food writer, which sounds like a fabulous job. <laughs> in her capacity as the latter, she won a James Beard Journalism Award for reporting on food and is the co-author of a New York Times best-selling cookbook about barbecue. She has been an editor on staff at Food and Wine Magazine, and her writing on food has appeared in the New York Times, Oprah Magazine, Newsweek, and many other publications. She is a graduate of Northwestern University, where she studied journalism, creative writing, and anthropology. At Duke, her ethnographic fieldwork concerns the materiality and effects of food and waste among immigrant and refugee communities in Brussels, she also studies current European Union food waste politics and sustainability goals. Thanks for having me. Um, I always put the food person last, always. Um, it's good, it's good for me. This is um, part of my research actually, and it's also part of my heart. That's a photograph of my grandmother's um, Jewish style braised brisket. And uh, I could be the poster child for the Society of Fellows because of this, but I'll get to that in a moment. My work as an anthropologist is about the uses and meanings of food. Uh, I have a background as a food journalist, as Deidre just mentioned. And before that, I was trained as an anthropologist as an undergraduate. So I actually thought when I was a food reporter that I was being an anthropologist. All of the people in my department here would argue with you, but that was the idea I had in the back of my mind when I went and reported food stories is that I was doing a kind of anthropology. And so when I left the journalism world and came back into the academy to pursue anthropology more fully, I wanted to study the value of food, how food acquires value and for whom. So most people in the world of food who study cuisine in any way study in Europe, the cradle of cuisine, where it was born and where it thrives. Not only, but especially. So this is me doing my first uh, summer of field work. I work in a restaurant in Brussels called Le Truffe Noir. It's one of the only truffle restaurants in the world. Uh, it's incredibly well-renowned. I have some training. I've, I'm a graduate of a cooking school in New York. So that allowed me to be able to work in the kitchen as the lowliest chopper of herbs and peeler of carrots. But that is me going to work one day. Um, so what I was trying to study in the EU and in terms of cuisine was how food gets value in this very rarefied restaurant in Europe. Who gets to pay for it? Who gets to eat it versus who makes it? And then something happened to me along the way, which is a story that's very familiar in anthropology. While I was looking at that, I became interested very much in something else. So on the left, you'll see uh, seafood papillon. So that is a butterfly made out of smoked salmon that the restaurant where I work smokes itself, and a lobster tail, and some wasabi caviar. I made that. It took a really long time. It was very hard. Uh, and so in order to make that, what you see on the right that dumpster is only waste for making that one dish. So I became totally fixated on how making that produces that. How the production of oak cuisine necessitates the production of so much waste. And although it's almost impossible to see here, a lot of what is thrown away is perfectly good edible food that in any other context, somebody would be quite grateful to receive. So while I'm working on this, the context in the background um, is the EU sustainability goals. So the EU has in, adopted a huge food waste policy change shift as of 2015, where it's now illegal for large supermarket chains to throw away any food. They must donate or they face enormous fines. So this policy is gonna be extended to restaurants in the near future too, including the one where I work. So this shaped 
my research entirely, and I began following the waste to see not only waste that gets thrown away in restaurants like the one where I worked, but where supermarket waste was now going. And a, one of the places it's going is a social restaurant, which is generally a European concept. So this place is a job training program and also a soup kitchen. So it trains chefs who are immigrants and refugees. You know, Europe is facing a tremendous immigrant refugee crisis right now. They can get jobs here, they can get internships and learn how to cook, learn kitchen skills that will make it useful for them to work in the, in the restaurant market in Europe. And then also it's serving low cost meals to poor and immigrant refugee communities. And then I've also been working at the Federation of Brussels Food Banks, which receives all of those donations of food from supermarkets and restaurants and redistributes them to charities. So this is what my dissertation is largely about. It's mapping edibility, who has access to what kind of food in Europe now. So how this relates to the Society of Fellows is that in practicing the kind of arguments I'd like to make in my dissertation about the value of food, I wrote a paper for the Triple A is the big anthropology annual conference about brisket, a food I know a lot about, and how the uses and meanings of it can structure a certain migrant experience. So I'm, I come from a family of Jewish cooks who settled in the American South after World War II and made brisket. This is the topic of my study. I wrote a very long and involved paper about the history of migrant cuisine for a class I took here called The Politics and Obligations of Memory. And for our purposes, I presented the paper that I wanted to give at the conference, at the AAA conference, to my group, Religion and Public Life, here at the CES. And we workshopped it, and it was amazing. The scholars who read my work are not normally the people who were reading my work. So I got critique from political scientists asking me what I meant by the right to food. I got critique from a lawyer who works on agriculture and ecology asking me about where the food grew and came from. I got amazing comments on my paper, I was able to cut it down, I was able to present it at the conference, and then my paper on brisket at the AAA was um, so well received that the AAA published it in their newsletter for all of the anthropologists. So I have them to thank. That's my story. <laughs> So I'm going to open the floor up to Malachi. I think he wanted to say some final comments about the Society of Fellows and put some things in context in terms of how the group works. And then we'll open the floor up to discussion. Oh, no, I, I, I don't have at this point after <laughs> those excellently fascinating presentations. I don't have much, uh, much, much to say. I have some questions, but perhaps I mean, the audience should start first with the questions. Oh, you know what? Let me start with a question. <laughs> so, uh, it, it, it's, it's also wonderful, right? It's, um, but interdisciplinary dialogue is always difficult. I remember when I participated in a faculty group 10 years ago of people from different disciplines, I needed to do a lot of translations, and there were lots of animosities in the room because how come people can approach the subject from such a different view? Uh, tell us something about the difficulties you've been facing in conducting dialogue, interdisciplinary dialogue. There's, there's often work you have to do up front when you're presenting work to a, um, a group of scholars from different disciplines. Um, so we usually uh, encourage people who are presenting to give um, kind of an explanatory note before they post, on, post their work on the blog for people to read. Um, and we also usually ask people to um, to point out things that they want, um, that they think they need feedback on, or that they want uh, readers to focus on. So I think um, it, it it does require some extra work, um, but um, usually during the course of the um, hour long or so discussion of, of, of whatever we're reading, those sorts of questions or ambiguities, um, or, often the, the result, I think. 
It can be quite challenging to uh, talk to people who don't share the same vocabulary as you or share the same point of reference. Eliza can say to me, if you're talking about brisket as an ideological state apparatus, why don't you say Altazare? And I can say to her, how can you possibly write this paper about French comics and not have Levi Strauss? How can you do that? So those kinds of things do come up, yes. <laughs> Across the four years, we've actually, um, every year we revisit, and, and, and this year we implemented a, a pretty significant change. Last year we had very early career graduate students, MA students, through junior faculty. Um, and we had a large group, between 10 to 14 would attend. Um, and it was too large, it was too unwieldy, and it was too top heavy. So the second and third years got lost in the shuffle. They didn't quite know how to respond to some things. They looked to other people to, uh, as, you know, to, to show them the way. Um, they, they struggle with the language on, in commenting. Um, there's a lot of nerves and a lot of insecurities. You don't want to, to, to comment on somebody's paper that's about to be published. So in their own field, it's already gotten a seal of approval as sort of expertise. Um, that was a difficult year. This year we split it in two um, according, to, according to sort of, we have a lot of overlap actually, but, but we have more focused groups and they're smaller groups and I think it's more effective. So my question was along uh, the vein of Malachi's, but I wanted to know, you know, you've got Muslims and Jews and I wanted to know how the greater political challenges um, might interfere with your working together. Um, and that's one question. The second, can I have your family's brisket recipe? Please? Yes. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> so I guess this is a political question. Um, so that I think that the interesting thing that you see, I focus a lot when we, we look at, um, when I look at the Muslim experience now and what's going on, there's a lot, especially now in 2017 more so than last year, you see a lot of parallels to um, the Jewish American experience. And just like when we think about race and religion, we've never really, at least in political science and the discourse I look at, we've, we're now applying it to Muslims. But then a lot of it, you can discourse that the Jewish experience has been similar, right? And a lot of the things I've seen on the grounds as sort of someone that's looking at this as a, from a social scientist is alliance building. And so the hate crimes that have been happening recently have not just been targeted towards Muslims. I'm from um, Northwest Ohio and our Jewish community center was the first place that actually faced um, like phone calls, writing phone calls, things like that. So then as a political scientist, I think like what are moments, what are conditions that may bring groups together to form alliances? And so I think that's an interesting question that I think about now that given the current context of what's going on in the US, because I my focus is primarily on American politics. So everything I look at is like what's happening in US politics and how does it affect minority groups in US politics. So I think that the political conditions changing is going to make folks come together and build coalitions. And this whole coalition building literature is not something I'm totally familiar with, but it's going to provide an interesting point of people coming together to build coalitions in ways they may not have done in the past. I can comment really quickly on that, too. Um, having seen about 40 people come through here, it's just not, it's just not a problem. It's just not even, it's not even an undercurrent. Um, I would say most of us are interested um, either uh, historically, sociologically, what have you, in the relationship between um, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, both past and present in Europe. So I think we're um, particularly aware of the, um, of the um, long history of, of both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and how they relate to European identity. And I think that perspective um, is um, um, something that, that uh, um, we all share. I think that's right. I think it's not always the same language, but looking at the same sets of problems and issues. The night that we workshopped my brisket paper was actually the night of the election. So this group of interdisciplinary young scholars were together working on a paper about brisket as a form of identity while we were getting election results. It was an absolutely unforgettable experience. Yes. 
to have been in that room together. And I would say if there were differences, then there weren't. <laughs> this question is for Mr. Siddiq. Yeah. Um, in the late 70s and a, a lot throughout the, the late 60s and a lot throughout the 70s, there was a large influx of black Americans um, really um, kind of involved in, a, in the Muslim uh, mm -hmm. faith. Um, what are your students saying now? Uh, what, what, are they, what are their most involved and what are their most important questions? And what are the big discussions in your classes with the students today concerning, concerning that topic? Concerning the role of like uh, black Americans in right. Islam. Mm -hmm. So right now, in the, in one of the most interesting, um, I think, places, it's been two things. Last year, Mo the passing of Muhammad Ali has brought a lot of like conversation about like athletes and politics, and especially Muhammad Ali's legacy. And then uh, I'm TAing the history of hip hop this semester. Really awesome class. And one specific so a part of the class is on the influence of Muslims in hip hop. So you're saying Muslims, we're talking about black Muslims who were artists. And so a lot of like early hip hop is political, but it's also infused with lyrics about Islam, 5%, like the different strands of Islam. So this, in, uh, this intersection of music and politics, at least for the undergraduates I'm working with, isn't something they've thought about a lot. But now they all came into the class, a lot of them, because they just like hip hop. And now they're looking at the history and really realizing like the legacy of the 60s and 70s that influenced hip hop and like how the, the, the consciousness of like and the political issues that came into hip hop, a lot of it came because of the black Muslim community utilizing hip hop as a tool to kind of discourse around it. So that's been like the, that's on my mind because I'm teeing the class, but um, yeah. It's an interesting way to engage in public life because I don't, I don't never really thought about music in public life, but now that I'm like helping teach this class, it's making me re-examine how music and public life come together. So I will, of course, let our esteemed director close things out. But I do want to say, if you want to find out more about our working groups and the Society of Fellows, please do check out our website. Um, that information, you can actually access it through the DUSIGS, which is the Duke University Center for International and Global Studies, who kindly helps support this. Um, their website, we're warehoused on there. Um, we're on the sidebar, Council for European Studies. It's just igs.edu. Um, and um, there's information about our working groups, more details about how things run, some of the other things that we do, including the videos. Um, our fellows have the option of recording videos. Um, to talk about their research, and it creates kind of a nice promotional package that they can actually use in their professional lives once they leave. And of course, our private blogs, the, um, the publishing options for covering events for CES, and of course, our monthly meetings. So we really do a lot. It's a fantastic group, as you can tell. And Malachi, is there anything else that you would like to add? Yeah, I, I, I like the way in which the presentations and the questions actually came, came together to illustrate something which is very essential about, I think, the society of, uh, the society of fellows. And I guess you all, you all saw how each and every of the presentation addressed some of the crucial issues that are right now on the political agenda, uh, whether they have to do with race and ethnic relationship, the vestiges of colonialism, um, or uh, with issues relating to nationalism and the nation state and pluralism. So each and every of our presenters uh, is working on a subject that has major ramifications of the day. And then the question came from, from the audience, the wonderful question, uh, how does the politics from the outside disrupt your discussion? Um, and it does, and that's the whole idea. And the whole idea is to create a safe space where scholarly exchange can take place because people share, share interests and share goodwill and share form of civility and of discourse, whereby they can address all of those questions of today that on the, in, in politics itself we do not see addressed. And when we attempt to attack them directly, by focusing on the particular political issues, we always get into a fight. So the way in which we, in the Council of European Studies, chose to address them is precisely to create that safe space 
will people can have civilized discourse on them and address some of those issues. And this may be a beginning and an example and a model for others on how they may imitate the type of wonderful discourse that you saw displayed here today. So I really appreciate the presentation. I appreciate you all coming. And I hope you will be coming in to future events where I'm sure all of the people that you saw today are going to be starring again. Thank you. 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 Th